Thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk about a somewhat more technical topic here today. The point, however, that I want to make today is while the technical details I'll be discussing may not be directly relevant to what you do, the ideas hopefully will motivate you to look for computer science beyond just the traditional notion of creating web pages or boring uh, corporate application that trade stocks or something like that. What I want to explore today is the notion how we can take the disparate things that we do and have today in our connected lives and bring them together, not just in the virtual world, but in the physical world as well. It's a project that we've started in my lab to explore the connection between what we have, the calendars, the web pages, the Twitters, and what happens in the real world. Often, we seem utterly disconnected. I'll try to convince you that programming is no longer a specialty discipline, only reserved to some cadre of a cult which is then labeled geeks or being people that couldn't get a date or something. It's people that we do programming is as natural as writing. It's as natural as any other creative uh, enterprise that we engage in. It's just been extremely tedious and to some extent unsatisfying simply because the technology that we've had was so primitive. We are starting, we are just starting to fix them. We also have developed because of historical artifacts, because of business relationships, because of economic issues, a set of silos where we focus on Twitter, we focus on voice of IP, we focus on videos, instead of seeing those as a pattern of a whole that is much more powerful if we integrate those than if we treat them separately. And indeed, we can make, instead of just taking tools and entertainment that is provided to us as given and unalterable, we can, even if we do not want to create those tools from scratch, which few of us have the time, energy, and skills to do, we can modify and tweak these tools in new ways that are accessible to a much larger group of us. I want to, as an illustration of a very basic approach to that, give you a quick overview of a tool that we've been starting to explore. Uh, but they're based on the notion of events and actions and the notion of context. And then I'll try to give you an idea of what might be next in it. And if the demo gods play along, I might actually show you a quick demo here as well. When we think of programmers, we think of people who are paid as computer scientists to work in a company, be it Microsoft or be it Goldman Sachs, to create code for a living. They're paid to churn out lines of code as an old assembly line might churn out widgets. But if we start to look at that, we actually have a pyramid with a very small tip of people who develop very specialized, highly technical uh, software solution, typically called firmware uh, in that, that you might have in a car or might have uh, in the BIOS in your PC. And we then move for people who write operating systems, people who write Java code, and then we have some probably uh, more and more people here you might find in this audience is who actually write uh, scripts in various languages, PHP, Ruby, uh, popular. Just curiosity, show of hands, who programs like in a scripting language here? Uh, PHP or Java, a few. Then we get people who write simple, relatively speaking, HTML. They might write a web page. Who has put together a web page where you know tags and stuff like that? A few more people. Right. Then we have people, and this is hopefully a bad example, it's not the most exciting application in the world, but I suspect many of you will indeed learn to love, hate it, uh, is they have to deal with Excel. And as soon as you do more than simply type a number in there, and as soon as you put an equal sign in a formula please, you have written a very small program. It just happens to be not visible. It doesn't scream programming at you. Who has done Excel formulas, maybe even macros, anything like that? Almost, well, a good half of it. 
So you are, even though you may not want to admit it, you are a budding by necessity programmer. And then we get people whose programming skills are limited to programming via DVR, and then we get a pretty broad population that leave their video recorder or whatever else they still have blinking at 12. I'm not going to be addressing that audience here. I suspect it's not typically found in this room either. We tend to think of programming as that type of stuff. And it not, none of this is useless or bad. It is just only one facet of how we think of how we can control the world. Programming is really about making computers do what we want them to do, as opposed to simply taking what whoever did the programming thought we might want them to do. And that used to be, and again, uh, probably slightly beyond your age bracket, used to be kind of a natural thing that when computers started, everybody had to be a programmer. If you got the first TRS-80, that was my first computer, then you didn't have much, didn't do much beyond blink a green cursor if you didn't program it. And so you have assembly language or you have Java in there. It doesn't immediately scream at what it does. What it does, if you can figure it out, isn't terribly interesting. It's just a Tarnoi type of application, et cetera. But we are starting to see improvement. And as often happens as you take kind of the consumerization of information technology, you have that things that uh, maybe we are too embarrassed to do for adults, we allow kids to do. Kids, in some cases, have better programming tools than many adults have access to. This is an example of a system called Scratch, uh, which was developed at MIT, and it allows relatively young kids, starting maybe in middle school or maybe even younger, to write programs, even though they don't really call them that, they're more like animations, that allow them to prevent, pre present and build simple games that uh, in some cases, interact with the real world. You can buy little light sensors that go with a scratch system, et cetera. And they do that in a way that has some semblance to programming, but is designed to actually be immediate. You get feedback immediately, does something interesting. You can share what you're doing with others. All the things that classical programming didn't do. Or this is an example for uh, Lego-style programming. So this is the programming language which Lego Mindstorms uses to, uh, it's not really a language, it's a graphical way of connecting boxes, like a storage container, like a suitcase there, a microphone, in ways to do simple, in this case, just simply compute the volume of sound which the robot senses on the environment. So we're moving towards an environment where programming is no longer just simply slinging words together in some obscure way dominated by syntax. And indeed, the other examples there are examples of other smaller programs that are much more accessible, even if they're still fairly obscure in their sensitivity to small mistakes. We've also had the notion that services could be intelligent. I'm working with the phone business uh, is one of my areas of interest. And we had the notion that you could program your phone in some way. The services you could do weren't terribly interesting. You could program your call redirection, revoice, et cetera. The other thing which has been happening recently, that we are transitioning more or less silently of our, in the community, it's become a fairly broad pattern, from a notion that you're service is defined by a web page, just being kind of an early Facebook page there. At that level, when Facebook and many other applications started, what Facebook showed you on your web browser, that's all you got. If Facebook didn't do what you liked them to do, didn't have the data accessible, the way you presented it, well, that was just too bad. The only alternative was to try to build another social network applications, which I suspect quite a few people have tried and done more or less successfully along the years. But there was no way to get at it except as a rendered web page. We can now do better. Almost all applications expect now that immediately you have not just a Facebook page, a web page, but that you have an application programming interface, an API available, so that services become accessible to other programs. They no longer stand alone. That is a fundamental shift 
that an application is no longer simply something which sits there all in its own universe, but it can be connected to others. Unfortunately, when you look at those APIs, like dev.whatever pages that you see for companies, they are generally designed for hardcore programmers. They're designed for people who do programming for a living. They're often fairly obscure, fairly difficult to get right, and require a fairly deep knowledge of computer science or at least experience in programming. It's a first step, but I believe it is just a first step. The other problem that we've had is that we've had these silos of services that are existing as defined industry almost. So we have location-based services. We have social services, social network type services. We have a physical world, the lights, bulbs, and the thermostats. And we have media services and communication services like email and instant messaging uh, and phone services in particular. <laughs> which are largely, again, as if they only existed, the world doesn't exist around them. You can clearly sometimes connect them. Your Twitter will send you an email, that type of thing. But it's a very shallow integration. It doesn't do anything interesting, and it only does the thing that whatever designer designed it to do. What we are trying to do is explore the intersection between three fundamental classes of services namely the real world that generally consists of location of people and objects and things in, in the real physical world, as well as sensors and actuators, sensors being things that measure things from simple temperature to humidity of the, uh, of the ground to more complicated things like traffic volume and so on. To web services, anything which has a web interface, be it social networks or more business-oriented, productivity-oriented things, like calendars and contacts, which manage our day-to-day -day life indirectly. They're the virtual representation of our physical day-to-day -day, uh, real-world existence. And finally, communication application, which allows us to communicate in a variety of media, audio, video, or text, with others uh, in the world. All of these are useful in themselves. They can be much more useful if you can use those as building blocks for a larger enterprise. So what we're building is a system which allows you to take a set of events that these type of systems generate and allow them to trigger a set of actions. Here are just a few examples of the kind of events that we're thinking about now, and indeed part of but going forward is to get input on what are other kinds of events that one might use beyond that. But hopefully we'll explore some of those options uh, that then motivate others to go beyond those. So it could be as simple as updates and presence, which is the online, offline, kind of busy type stuff. Do you get calls, incoming mobile or other calls? Email, calendar entry, sensor inputs, and location updates. Those are examples of events that reflect me in some sense or some other people that I care about, and those can become part of an input into things that we want to do. We can then take actions. Anything which allows it to be controlled electronically by a computer, by a web interface, can become part of an action. It used to be that it was very limited. You could send an email that was pretty much it that you could do usefully electronically. Nowadays, more and more things will get connected, are connected, including the physical world. You've probably heard about the smart grid. Uh, you've heard about cars that have uh, become now more integrated as opposed to isolated systems. All of these things suddenly be can become our actuators, our way to reach out into the world. So we're building a system which tries to integrate a variety of tools for monitoring um, energy usage, to controlling appliances, to classical business phones, to uh, SMS and uh, instant messaging type of things, to address books, to your calendar, and to social network and communication applications. In a way that from a user perspective, I don't have to think of those anymore as separate, isolated components. Why it works, our system is fairly basic, it's a graduate research project, 
it, you have a web page where you provide simple scripts. So here, for example, it says a simple language says every day at 4.15 PM, you do something, kind of simple alert application that reminds you to take a break or whatever. And then you can provide a set of actions which are triggered on the outside or on the inside of the system. You can then connect those where your standard world, your Twitter, your Flickr, your lad, Google Latitude, your Facebook, and this is a voicemail, voice uh, type of phone system uh, style system. All of those can be connected using uh, an authorization technology, which is allows you to give an application privileges to access selected pieces of your data. So whatever kind of things, what kind of programs that you can write, and these are very much exactly the representation of the kind, what a program would look like. So it consists of a, a statement, which is a simplified, structured form of English, namely something like, if I'm within two miles of my home, set my thermostat higher to 68 degrees because I'm about to go home. So that's examples of how you might use that to save energy. You might uh, have an application which keeps your, ha uh, your house I uh, uh, lived in, so every sunrise you turn the lights off, and every sunset you turn some selected lights on. Is it, that's a program which hides all the details of what a thermostat uses to be controlled, how you find out where the distance between me and my, uh, is, what my home is. That's all as context back in the background of a system that the user does not have to laboriously create. It is just there because it's reusable across applications. Or we could try to make our phone more polite. I'm actually utterly surprised and pleased that no phone, as far as I've heard, has gone off all afternoon. We've all been trained, but we shouldn't have to be trained to do that. Our system should be smart enough to know that depending on what I'm doing, and my calendar already knows that, it knows that I'm right here now at the TEDx event, they should be able to tell my phone what to do and do it smartly without having to be reminded at the beginning of a performance to all oh, please put your phone on vibrate. So I can now, if my activity happens to be as part of performance, I forward calls to voicemail, I can schedule, uh, it, uh, put calls received in my calendar, I can mute the sound, and I can, if I want to do that, do a flashing of lights if I need a visual indicator that my, a fall, call has been received. I can use these type of services to schedule reminders and similar type of services. And those are meant not as these are smart things to do or particularly interesting, but you can create them in five minutes just on the fly because it's just something that's easy enough to do that it's not worth writing a real program for, but it's worth spending a few minutes on. So you can get the uh, don't forget the milk type of reminders. You can build an application like that. They obviously exist as a canned application, but now you can create one which does exactly what you want to do. You can send reminders, and you can have more complicated kind of social arrangements. It looks at your calendar, it checks your location, and it knows the event participants uh, and sends them an email uh, telling them that you might be running late for the meeting simply because you're too far away from a meeting to make it in time. Again, not useful as a canned application, but very easy to create in that one. You can then label your world so that you can create labels that are meaningful to your environment, such as Columbia buildings in this particular one that you can label what they do. So we've been trying to connect some real world devices. I'll actually have one here uh, that is one of those. It's a little wireless device uh, that are now available. And I will, anybody who has any type of experimental uh, interest highly recommend these type of systems because they now allow it even to be the physical world, not to be not just something you have other people do. When engineers in my age bracket grew up, we all had a vector set type of things or Legos or equivalent because it was something that you could actually build physical things. We've now retreated into our virtual world. I think we now have the opportunity to re-engage the physical world and actually do things ourselves as opposed to waiting for Apple or Sony or anybody else to license us to build gadgets that we can actually use to interact. So 
So this is a setup uh, that we would just we use to control lights. It's just simple, small boxes, cost a few dollars, uh, through a internet interface that allows those then to be controlled. That's the little locator box, which I will hopefully be showing uh, in a minute or two, uh, which allows me to um, move around the stage and indicate through a small program what it actually, where I am, and trigger very trivial actions in this case uh, based on that. So what's next? What more can we do? There's plenty of things we can integrate. But an important consideration to think about is we're now getting technology, such as the one that's implemented in Apple Siri, that we can use as a different way of thinking about programming. Namely, we can start to think about natural language input. We have to be careful. Uh, we don't want uh, uh, also natural language to be as ambiguous to suddenly do bad things in the real world. Uh, instead of just rescheduling a meeting, it might actually might set your thermostat to 85 degrees when you're not home because it didn't quite understand what you meant. Much more dangerous, and so we have to be a bit more careful with that. But there are opportunities there. There's lots of devices that we should think about that instead of just thinking of web services as having an API as being a standard feature, we should think of a real world as having these things. Our cars should have APIs, our home heating systems should have APIs, and all of our appliances should have those. It's becoming cheap enough to do that now and allows us to take ownership of our devices to make those devices do much more than they were designed for. We need a more extensible architecture so that other people can add more information sources and actuate us to the system. We talk a lot about user-generated content, the hot new thing, not so much anymore, a few years ago, that moving from a centrally provided content to user-generated content. We now need to think beyond that as user-generated functionality. Take control not just of the video bits, the text bits on the web page, but to take much more deep control of how the world works that we are constructing around us. We can use that to provide very low cost, low effort things that would never be commercially sufficiently valuable to be created. And we can now take ownership of our world as opposed to waiting for others to design it for us. We want to create functions in the large and recognize that programming is more than just Java and PHP experts. It is actually something that all of us can and should do, just like we expect not to, somebody else to just write or create videos or create other content. It is not a separate world. If you can create blog content, why shouldn't you also create functionality for the world that you live in? And with that, oops, just slide that over. Uh, this is the interface uh, that has a number of services here. Uh, so in this particular case, there are two services uh, of interest. Uh, namely, I have a, uh, a first one, which is a very trivial application, which integrates a phone, a normal Android phone, and this application, namely a Twitter application. And the idea is when I shake the phone, that is sensed by the device. There is a program there. And there's a one-line program that simply, when it recognizes phone shaking in this particular case, sends a Twitter message to that. This is for really low-level sharing. If the uh, Facebook timeline isn't low-level enough for you, you can now share your phone movements, too. Let's go to Twitter. And the shaking simulates my, hopefully, fall, not quite falling off the stage. Let me show you another one. Uh, so this is another application where we build a very simple script. Namely, we have, as you see, some of you can see a green box there, and there's a red box behind the stage. Uh, there's a little location sensor that is a Zigbee device. It's $30 or something like that with a uh, homebrew uh, enclosure. And a simple uh, script which simply, again, uh, does a Twitter uh, feed. When I move to the left or right side of the stage, it will trigger a, tw uh, a Twitter message on the other side, simply because it senses the presence on one side of the stage or behind the curtain on, on the other side of the stage. Let's see if it did anything. 
Indeed, I've been moving around enough that I've been seen on the left and the right side of the stage. Again, not a particularly world-shaking application in and of itself, but it indicates that by combining things that had no notion that this device had no idea that it would ever want to talk to Twitter, you can now create those applications in a few minutes. Once you have the basic ingredients in place, you don't have to anticipate what they are. And with that, I encourage you to think of programming not as something that the 1% does, but it's something for the 99%. Thank you. <laughs>